Greetings to all our listeners, wherever you may be joining us from. Welcome back to our third episode of 5 Minutes Arcoma Talk on Onco Daily. I'm Shushan Hovsepian, pediatric oncologist from Armenia. And uh, if you are uh, interested in sarcomas, I would recommend our listeners to grab a cup of coffee as over the next uh, few minutes, we will explore the unique challenges of desmoid tumors. And today, our distinguished guest is uh, Dr. Aaron Weiss, who is the Division Chief of Pediatric Hematology Oncology at Mind Health, an Associate Professor at Tufts University School of Medicine and Sam Cohen, Medical Director in Don Chair at Mind Children's Cancer Program. He's also the Vice Chair of Soft Tissue Sarcoma Committee in Children's Oncology Group and the Vice Chair of the Clinical Trials AYA Oncology Discipline uh, committee. So welcome, Dr. Weiss. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thanks a lot for accepting our invitation. And let's, um, without further ado, let's start. Um, so as uh, I said, we are going to discuss desmoid tumors. And uh, could you explain uh, what desmoid tumors are and how they differ from other soft tissue sarcomas? What are the typical symptoms and signs of desmoid tumors? Yeah, desmoid tumors are extremely rare, um, more common in uh, kind of the um, young uh, female um, age range of when they're um, able to have, you know, like if most, most fertile, able to have children, and then also at an older age, so a little bit less common in, in younger children. But it's a slow, typically a slow growing type of tumor that can appear almost anywhere in the body. Um, the most common symptom is pain. Um, or just a visible lump if it's closer to the surface. But many people will have these desmoid tumors um, for long periods of time before they're discovered. Sometimes they're discovered by accident, um, and sometimes they're discovered when someone works somebody up for some type of uh, particular discomfort. Yeah, so um, thank you for mentioning that and um, building on that. So you said that it's uh, typically a very rare tumor, but uh, we always uh, encounter challenges for rare uh, tumors as uh, there are no uh, standard of care treatments. So uh, what are the um, currently primary mo treatment modalities available now, uh, both in systematic and also local therapies? Yeah, so desmoid tumors are tricky um, because for a long time um, they were treated as a surgical uh, disease. And so surgeons were often just taking them out, but we were finding that many times they would come back. And actually, due to a lot of work that's been done typically over in Europe, um, we've discovered that these tumors um, can sometimes spontaneously regress or get smaller on their own, or sometimes they can stabilize. And actually, even if we remove them, many times they come back. So we've looked to other types of modalities or treatments that we could offer patients. Um, it's also a little different how we think about treatment in children versus adults because of um, the size of the patients and potentially the toxicities or side effects. Um, but right now, um, the standard approach is typically actually ob observation and active, which another term of active surveillance, where we image patients and watch them and actually not treat them at all. That's become kind of the frontline standard for most patients. But when it starts to grow or cause symptoms, then we typically intervene. And a lot of the decisions are based on the location and the age of the patient. Um, so oftentimes we use systemic therapy. Um, we have IV chemotherapy type medicines, as well as oral medications that are a little bit more targeted um, with a little bit less side effects that um, oftentimes, I think now in the adult world, at least, most people standardly use some of the oral um, agents that have become available. Um, and in children, we'll sometimes use the oral agents or sometimes the IV chemotherapy medicines, depending on the age of the patient and how safe we feel it is for them to be on it. But if those, if they're not a candidate for systemic therapy or the tumor continues to grow, um, or sometimes, depending on location, a local modality, like you mentioned, is often used. And now more and more, we're using some of these local interventional approaches with certain radiation techniques that are um, have a little bit less side effects and have shown to be effective um, for many of our patient populations. But we have worked together with an international committee to help develop kind of a standard approach for how these patients are managed because it's so rare. I think it's important collectively that we come together to help decide the best way to treat these patients appropriately. Yeah, that's uh, very um, encouraging to 
see that there is a network working on this kind of rare tumors. And also you mentioned the role of surgery. Uh, I know that it's changing and uh, now a lot of patients are referred uh, directly to oncologists, uh, but at least in LMICs, uh, it's a common uh, problem that surgeons uh, move out the tumor and then patient comes uh, to an oncologist. So um, that's uh, for the conventional therapies. And what about the experimental therapies? Uh, are there any clinical trials, uh, both for uh, children and adults? Of course, uh, we know that the data is coming from adults, but uh, at least uh, right now, what is uh, ongoing? Yeah, so there are, in fact, there's a clinical trial that recently finished in the adult uh, population you, looking at a specific targeted medicine called a gamma secretase inhibitor. It was shown to be very effective when they gave it to patients that were randomized between getting the drug and getting the placebo or fake drug, and it was shown to be very effective. So while that was happening, in parallel, we ran a, a study for children so patients under 18 years of age with the same drug through the Children's Oncology Group, which is um, the Cancer Consortium for Children in North America. That study actually closed after we accrued the appropriate number of patients. And we'll be able to actually analyze the data starting in December of 2024. And I think at that point, we'll have a sense of the safety of the medication as, as well as how effective it is to help determine where in the priority of medications um, we would put that particular medicine. So right now, that is the only clinical trial, at least for children, that's um, that's ha that recently closed. There is another trial that's looking at another targeted medicine that affects the beta-catenin gene, which uh, is part of the pathway of, we think, for tumor growth and desmoid tumors. That's study being used not only for patients with desmoid, but other cancers that have beta-catenin involved in their growth as well. That study is also being run through the Children's Oncology Group. And so we'll have some data on the, the study was mainly for safety um, and finding the dose, but we'll also have some ability to be able to see whether it has some effect as well. Um, and so there is another study looking at a different gamma secretase inhibitor that is accruing patients uh, as well. Um, but those are the current studies that at least are happening from a, a systemic therapy standpoint and from a clinical trial basis. Yeah, that's very helpful. And uh, I guess uh, next year we will have a lot of new results from uh, for children. And um, so... Another thing, moving to another, uh, not an, another ex aspect. So you mentioned that uh, one of the um, ways to um, find uh, the solution is uh, the network. What are the other uh, ways? Uh, what do you recommend dealing with these challenges asso associated with desmoid tumors, particularly considering their rarity? How we should deal with these tumors? Yeah, I think because it's so rare and because we still don't know so much about it, I think the most important thing is that we have as many people thinking about this as possible and getting all different types of um, uh, of providers in the room. We need physicians who take care of children. We need physicians that take care of adults. We need the scientists who are doing the basic science and translational research to help determine um, how desmoid tumors form. Um, we need the people who are delivering certain types of inter interventions like interventional um, radiologic procedures, radiation, surgeons, getting all these people in a room together is the most important thing. And so we've been doing that. And through organizations like the Desmoid Tumor Research Foundation, um, they have an annual meeting. And as part of that meeting, they have a research day in which all these different people get together, both in person as well as a virtual component, to be able to talk about their research and as also to help develop priorities of what we feel as desmoid tumor experts would be the best way to move the field forward and develop ways to cure um, and help you know, with treatment of this disease. So I think the most important thing is getting like-minded people together to talk about these issues because um, if you work individually in separate silos, I think it'd be very difficult to make significant strides for this particular disease. Yeah, exactly. And also funding is very important. Even if the people are coming together and deciding uh, or writing a protocol, uh, if they don't have the funding, uh, um, it's uh, very tricky. And especially for rare disease, not, uh, um, not, there are very few companies that are interested to invest. 
You're absolutely right. I think that's probably one of the hardest things that we suffer from is that although we can raise money through different means, um, it's very difficult to get people behind something um, that's just not as common and if, and affects as many people. Yeah, that's true. And uh, moving to your personal journey, uh, how you decided to uh, in, to be personalized uh, in uh, pediatric oncology and uh, especially in uh, sarcomas, and how you would describe the role of mentors uh, on this way? Yeah, I think for many of us, um, it's not always a path that we thought we'd be doing. I was going to be a general pediatrician. And I think through some of my experiences of patients encounters during my training, as well as mentors that you mentioned, um, help shape what I enjoy doing. And I think what drew me most to the field was the ability to be able to take care of patients that are well, take care of patients that are not as well, take care of very sick patients and well patients in the same day, and deal with cutting edge research and be able to participate in that research in a meaningful way. It was kind of a field that encompassed everything as well as long term uh, and longitudinal relationships with patients and families. Um, and so that was really what drew me most into that. And through sarcoma, my main interest in desmoid tumors is largely based upon the, those that have mentored me um, through my training. I've always been interested in clinical research and getting involved in clinical research. And it just so happened that those people that I respected during my training and really took me under their wings are the ones working in that particular uh, area of research. And they allowed me opportunities to get involved. And so now in my role that I am in now, where I not only take care of patients, but also help to you know, develop clinical trials and, and strategically how to move things forward to be able to see young investigators that are interested uh, to help get them involved in projects, either their own projects or project ideas that we have that we just don't have enough people to help. Um, seeing them get involved and mentoring them and helping them to self-discover and, um, and get involved is really the, one of the most rewarding things about my job now that I enjoy most. Yeah, that's very motivational and uh, inspiring also for uh, young oncologists. And uh, uh, Dr. Weiss, uh, thanks a lot for sharing your expertise uh, on desmoid tumors and also on your personal journey. Uh, I think uh, it was a wonderful discussion. And uh, to our listeners, thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to exploring more topics uh, on sarcoma research and care in future uh, episodes. So thanks a lot. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for having this type of platform for us to talk about something that I think more people need to know about. So thank you so much. Thanks a lot.